challenges face. Uh, we have, uh, as you know, uh, during this recession, we have had to uh, make painful decisions about how to maintain the high quality of education, higher education conflict, uh, while cutting costs. And uh, things are not going to get better anytime quickly, but it really requires the attention of all the public. And these 50 doctoral students, I think, are like a wonderful living example of, uh, of what these uh, joint university systems provide for the state of California, not just in special education, but of course in special education and in other areas as well. So generally, the, the research that uh, the 26 of us do uh, generally falls into two areas. Uh, in one area, we have researchers that are working uh, mainly with respect to uh, developmental disabilities and autism, uh, the families of children who have these disabilities, and uh, the kinds of instructional interventions or uh, 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 developmental interventions that will uh, assist these students to make uh, adaptation to uh, family life uh, and schools. And the other set of people uh, generally are interested in children who have uh, learning difficulties and disabilities, behavior problems. Uh, this group is much more academically oriented than the first group because the children that we're concerned about uh, can perform in the academic curriculum. And uh, we have been for quite a long while, not by plan, but uh, by sort of convergence of interest. We've been very interested in um, Congressman Baca's story. Uh, we've been very concerned about children who are English language learners in California uh, who are over-identified as having disabilities. We are, however, interested in children who are English learners who really do have disabilities. And uh, making that distinction is a very difficult challenge, uh, but uh, we throw ourselves into a great enthusiasm. And so much of our work, as you read through the handout, you'll see much of our work addresses those kinds of issues. Uh, very specifically, the, these represent the, the kinds of specific uh, studies and research projects that we've been engaged in. And I'm not going to read the list for you, let you read it yourself. Um, Needless to say that we, we are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are interested in the, um, the practical implications of our work. We're not, we're not interested in uh, developing new knowledge just for the aesthetic pleasure of doing it. We, we also want uh, the knowledge to be applied and used in real situations. So we, uh, uh, almost to a person, we all work in schools. We all do applied work. We all have school partners and school partnerships. Um, we enjoy working uh, with schools. We, we shudder at the, uh, the enormous uh, stresses that are facing educators uh, in the public schools nowadays. And we, uh, we are enormously grateful for their uh, generosity in letting us uh, conduct our research in partnership with them, even though they are under all of this uh, stress. And uh, we look forward to working with uh, uh, ever more uh, professionals and practitioners. So if uh, any of you uh, come from districts that have a mind to be involved in research uh, involving children with disabilities, we're more than happy to talk to you. Uh, it's, our, it's our view that the world should not be divided between practitioners and researchers. Researchers ought to be interested in practice. And practitioners ought to realize that they're generating knowledge on almost an everyday basis. So uh, we're really in the same business and we don't like to think that uh, uh, we're on opposite sides of some divide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the research and I'm going to sort of give you these little bullet, uh, let's go through these bullets of the researchers. These are little shorthand notations about the projects that we, uh, we work on, but the, the fuller descriptions are in the handout that I gave you. Um, I want to, uh, as I begin this, this section here, I want to introduce two of my colleagues who are in the room from the University of California at Riverside, uh, and they're barely sitting behind this pillar here, and I can see, can see Dr. O'Connor. It's uh, Dr. Rolanda O'Connor and Dr. Michael Roscoe. Uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, uh, give them applause. I think together they, they actually 
cooperate several school districts in Riverside County. Um, uh, the, the work that we have, we do involves uh, medical doctors. We have a medical doctor, a pediatrician at uh, medical school at UC San Diego, uh, Dr. Uh, Howard Terrace, and another one uh, up north at uh, UC Davis, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Robin Hansen. And uh, of course, their interests are medical, but uh, there are many, many issues involving the education and development of children with disabilities that. Uh, uh, require biomedical kinds of investigations rather than behavioral investigations. And so uh, we're very pleased that they're with us. Uh, Dr. Uh, Taris uh, uh, actually is an uh, advisor, medical advisor to uh, Unified School District in San Diego. And uh, so his work is very practical. Uh, and you'll see that he's uh, very interested in the nature of the health services that are provided for children with disabilities. And one thing about children with disabilities is that uh, we tend to think about them only in terms of their disability. And they are whole children. Uh, they have health issues, they develop, they have gender, uh, and uh, we should uh, be certainly concerned about ameliorating their disabilities, but we should also be concerned about uh, the whole child, as uh, John mentioned a minute ago. Um, and uh, you'll you notice that my list goes from kind of south to north. At, uh, at UC Irvine, uh, uh, Dr. Penelope Collins has been a long-time researcher uh, on issues involving second language learning uh, and second language learners' acquisition of English and the risks that uh, uh, some children who are second language learners face for developing uh, learning disabilities. And uh, she's being joined uh, by a new faculty member who's not listed in this list. Uh, uh, this year, who has uh, come from uh, uh, Harvard and has uh, a, young, a young professor who is going to make a name for something else, I'm not sure. Uh, Dr. Farkas uh, is actually a sociologist uh, who, in the latter part of his career, has become uh, focally interested in children with disabilities and is involved in a big project right now about uh, early vocabulary development and uh, risks faced by preschoolers. Uh, Dr. Connor, who we just met, um, is, a, uh, is a nationally, internationally known researcher in the area of early interventions in reading. And uh, she is, uh, if I needed to ask somebody about uh, RTI and the response to intervention, she would be the one that I would consult. She's probably done the best empirical work on that in the field, in real schools, with real children. Uh, so if you're interested in RTI, she happens to be in the room, so catch her. Um, Dr. Lee Swanson, who is a colleague of Dr. Roscoe's and Dr. O'Connor's, uh, has been involved in uh, a number of research projects over the years involving cognitive processes that underlie learning disabilities, particularly problems involving uh, what's known as working memory. Working memory is uh, it's easy to understand. It's uh, when you're trying to uh, think about something, keep it in your memory so that it's current, and then try to go retrieve other, other memory from it long ago to uh, bring to bear on the problem. So keeping those two things in your mind at the same time turns out to be a, uh, a critical discriminator between children who have uh, many learning problems, especially reason problems, and children who don't. Uh, Dr. Roscoe, who we've also met, has uh, added immeasurably to our group in terms of uh, his work on culturally sensitive assessments and culturally sensitive uh, strategy training. Um, again, children are whole children, and uh, they come not just with their disabilities, they come with the culture, they come with the language, they come with all the other factors that I just mentioned, and uh, he, draw, uh, he brings light to that matter. Um, our two colleagues at, uh, uh, at UCLA, Dr. Uh, Connie Kasseri and Dr. Jeff Wood, are involved with uh, studies on uh, autism. They, they, together, they really span everything from infancy to adolescence. Uh, we're very interested, uh, as are most of the researchers in the center, uh, in applying a, a version of um, uh, what's called pivotal response theory. Uh, I almost hesitate to say theory because it, there's so many studies that have been done now with pivotal response methods that it, it hardly merits calling it a theory. It sounds like it's, it's speculative, but, but we, we have... Uh, volumes of evidence that pivotal response approaches to children with autism and severe developmental disabilities 
is highly effective and, uh, and brings those children into uh, contact with normal, ex normal learning experiences both in uh, family life and in schools. Uh, Chris Kate, uh, who just joined us recently at uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, is a, sort of an outlier because he's interested in traumatic stress and uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, he's done what I think is the first work on student veterans. So you know that we have a, a new GI Bill now that helps uh, veterans from our recent wars to acquire a college education. And, uh, and among uh, those veterans are individuals who uh, have suffered traumatic stress or brain injury, or traumatic brain injury uh, as part of during their service. And Chris has uh, begun working uh, with those people. He's also the research director for the Student Veterans of America. So uh, I expect we're going to hear a lot more from Chris. Uh, Dr. Amber Moran just recently joined us also. She does work on uh, math word problem solving. Um, you know that uh, word problem solving is uh, one of the gateways to algebra. And past algebra you have all of the uh, science and mathematical and engineering fields are open to you. So if children with disabilities are to be, have access to those kinds of fields, they've got to get through word problem solving. Um, there's uh, me and uh, uh, Bob Cagle and Lynn Cagle uh, have a, a world-renowned clinic on autism at our campus. Uh, Bob and Lynn were the primary developers of the idea about pivotal response instruction, and they uh, um, continue to do numerous studies uh, to uh, extend uh, that technique and that strategy to other areas. Um, my colleague, Ian Wong, just uh, formed a, uh, a center for uh, research in the Pacific Rim with about 12 Pacific Rim countries on special education and disabilities and risk. Um, he also spends a lot of his time doing research on uh, cultural adaptations for schools to use in doing the positive behavioral supports programs that John was just mentioning a moment ago. Uh, Ann Cunningham up in Berkeley. Uh, has been working with uh, teacher study groups as a way of providing uh, new ways for teachers to have to take, to take ownership of their own professional development. Dr. Emily Soleri is a new professor at uh, UC Davis, uh, also works in the area of early interventions to children with uh, disabilities, particularly uh, reading disability for children who are English language learners. Uh, she speaks Spanish fluently and uh, she's worked mostly on the area of listening and reading comprehension. Where the most recent work in the field has been really about word level kinds of problems that children have. She works on text level problems. Uh, Dr. Peter Abundi is a uh, very well known researcher who is doing something uh, very unusual right now, working on a project involving the use of virtual reality applications. Uh, I'm sort of thinking about it's a holiday, a trek. He's using virtual reality applications to study attention and learning in children with uh, autism and ADHD. And I mentioned to you Dr. Hansen earlier. So that's that's not all of us, but that's that's a sort of a sampling of what we're involved in. And I hope that you will agree that the work we're doing is pertinent and uh, useful to uh, not only uh, the field, but uh, also to uh, practitioners in the state of California. Well, let me turn, uh, let me pivot to some research issues. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, autism and learning disabilities because those are the two areas that we collectively uh, best address. You're all familiar with this. Uh, California uh, sort of discovered the explosion, uh, the epidemic of autism. Uh, when we looked at our state statistics from the early 1990s to the early 2000s, uh, we saw this enormous increase in prevalence. Now, clearly we now understand that some of this increase in prevalence has to do with uh, the formulation of the concept of, a, of an autism spectrum. So clearly that we were now collecting together children who previously would have received other classifications or diagnoses. Um, and also we were getting a little sharper at picking out these kids. But uh, even when you subtract away the kids that are being identified because we're more knowledgeable and the kids that fit into the spectrum, we still are left with uh, an increase in prevalence that we don't understand. 
Um, so internationally, this is a problem. And California uh, sort of called to the world's attention uh, by these kinds of data. So uh, this is enormously expensive for the schools because uh, now, seemingly out of nowhere, uh, there are these uh, hundreds and hundreds of children with autism that are suddenly visible in the schools, and uh, the schools are generally ill-prepared to deal with them. Even the excellent special edu education teachers that you employ uh, may have come to their license and their practice uh, sometime after this uh, rapid increase occurred, and they may not be uh, well-schooled in uh, the most current methods for identifying and treating children with autism. So, so most school districts in the state find, and in the country indeed, find themselves uh, being pressed strongly to respond to this. Uh, you probably know that, that the, uh, the uh, American Psychiatric uh, Association, which is responsible for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, known as DSM, is uh, revising that manual to create a fifth edition. And, uh, and one of the things that will happen in that manual that is pertinent to all of us is that they are probably going to uh, restrict the definition of autism uh, at the high end. That they're going to redefine autism in a way that will probably lead to fewer diagnoses of, uh, of uh, Asperger's and fewer uh, diagnoses of high-functioning autism. So in, in some sense that promises a, a relief for the schools if fewer children are being identified. On the other hand, if you're as old as I am, and you remember back in the early 1970s, we defined a way uh, mild mental retardation. Now, the, the category no longer exists. The children still exist. So uh, swapping definitions around isn't going to make life easier for you. But, the, but in terms of formal classification, there may be some relief uh, if that new definition goes through. The, the second thing is that they're, for the first time, they're including a definition of learning disabilities. And uh, that, that will be helpful because uh, if you've been in the field for a while, you know we've had chronic difficulties kind of pinning down exactly what we mean by learning disabilities. And uh, across the states, in the last annual report to Congress, the difference is uh, in identification rates across the states uh, vary from 2% to 8% of the school population. So this is after uh, you know, almost 40 years. The first learning disabilities legislation was actually in 1969. So if you think about it, that uh, we haven't been able to sort of nail down a set of identification procedures that um, meet both practical and scientific uh, criteria. Well, this, uh, this actually just came out this week in the uh, journal Pediatrics. Uh, so it, it sort of captured my imagination, so I thought I'd throw it in to show it to you, because I think it, I think it, I think it represents the, 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 the new direction that science of individual differences was going to take. This was a, uh, a study using uh, some high-powered statistical methods that um, See my little red spot here. That that takes a uh, a group of children that are identified um, uh, in uh, the way in which they respond to model communication, their social behavior, and their competitive behavior. These three separate graphs, and it uses a set of uh, sophisticated statistical techniques to discover uh, a group subgroups of children that are very similar to one another and different from the other children. So you can see that uh, there are six different developmental trajectories over years, there's years, there's age, six different developmental trajectories that are very distinctive among this group of children that have the same diagnosis of autism. Um, so this, this represents groupings based upon measures of model communication. This is uh, for social behavior and this is for repetitive behavior. And uh, these two particularly are very similar. And essentially, they, they break out into uh, a group of children, let's say here at the bottom, who are, um, who, are, who are very low, and they remain low in the performance of those skills over the age span. Uh, and then you have uh, groups that, are, that have higher uh, rates of, uh, of uh, growth or higher rates of positive behavior. 
but they're very distinctive groups, and the, and the possibility is, is that there are actually differential treatments for the different groups. So you know that when we draw lines for children with disabilities, we're drawing lines that try to make a seamless world sensible to ourselves. So we should not take the lines too seriously. The lines are only intended to facilitate taking action. And uh, so this doesn't mean there are six kinds of autism. This means that we can think of children with autism uh, as having six different inclinations in their developmental profile that may be useful to us in how we formulate our instructional plans. Now the, the technique that was used to uh, do this research is now becoming much more widespread. It's being applied to uh, learning disabilities as well. Well, here's the area of learning disabilities. If we go back in history a little bit, this area, the, um, these are the rates of identification, uh, the national rates of identification from uh, the beginning, uh, from the first passage of the law until uh, the latest uh, uh, date here is 1992. And you can see the phenomenon, if you were working back then, the phenomenon of learning disabilities going from uh, an estimated 1% before Congress uh, in 1974, 75, to a, an identified rate that was well over 5% of the school population by uh, 1993. And that, can, and, and that, of course, caused enormous panic, not only among uh, policymakers, but also among school administrators. Well, things have changed a bit. Uh, if you look at 1999 uh, to 2009, this last decade, uh, notice the red line here that uh, that the identification rates, the classification rates of children with learning disabilities has declined from over 5% to just over 4%. Uh, now, this doesn't have anything to do with uh, response to intervention as an alternative way of identifying children because response to intervention isn't widespread enough, isn't well established enough to have caused this to happen. Uh, it's, 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 it's troubling and interesting, depending on how you think about it. It's troubling uh, that suddenly we have that many fewer children being identified, and we're wondering, like, where are those children? What, what happened to them? I'm taking you, reminding you of the case of uh, mild mental retardation. That not identifying children doesn't mean that the children go away. So uh, it's a little troublesome to know that we've, de that we've decreased identifications that much and uh, we like to believe that somehow we're more accurate in uh, identification processes, but nobody knows that is for sure. Uh, particularly when you can see that, that, uh, that other kinds of disabilities, like autism, have, even though these are relatively small percentages of the school age population, that's an enormous increase over that decade. So uh, it's curious to know exactly what's going on and uh, going forward. Uh, want to be investigating that. Uh, this is a, a really interesting study that was also uh, recently done by uh, public health services. And uh, here what they've done is they've looked at, um, they've looked at health indicators. How many, how many health indi indications there are of risk for a uh, population of children as it relates to uh, learning disabilities. And so going from right to left to right here, these are the number of identified health risks. That's what SHCN is. Uh, it's, I think it's uh, kind of guess is health, health uh, children, uh, health, health for children with needs, and um, with health needs. And uh, these are the number of risk indicators. These are health indicators now. Uh, and this is the percentage of children. In those who have that number of risk needs or learning disabilities. So the interesting thing to note here is that when children have none of these particular health needs, this is the sort of baseline uh, identification rate, about 5% of, of the children in the U.S. And uh, as you add health risks, learning disabilities goes up to 86% for children who have uh, five uh, four or five health risks. So the issues of children's general health and well-being and their ability to profit from education at school are linked together. They're not, they're not separate factors. And then one more. Uh, here we have uh, the phenomenon of low birth weight. Children who are born under 25 
100 grams. Uh, these are children who have LD only. This is the, the dark blue or the dark purple is the uh, percentage of uh, kids with learning disabilities who had low birth weight compared to those who do not. Here's the kids that have both LD and ADHD. Again, you can see the kids with low birth weight are much higher risk, and ADHD only is a marginally higher risk for them. So there's a number of um, sort of socioeconomic conditions that are associated with health risks that find their way into schools as learning problems. So I'm going to briefly talk about policy now and give you my take on policy. Um, John covered some of this, so I'm, not, I'm going to try to hasten through it. Um, but the two policies that are concerning here are the Elementary Secondary Education Act of 1965, which in our recent memory is no child left behind. Um, the, the, the point of this policy was to uh, create educational programs that compensated in some way for uh, disadvantaged uh, family backgrounds. And the, the focus was school level planning uh, with parent advisory counselors. So there was supposed to be some school level response to the entire group of children that met that uh, criteria of being uh, underprivileged or low income. And the resources that were given to the schools from the federal government were of course meant to uh, supplement and not supplant the local education agency's efforts. The Education of Handicapped Children Act that came 10 years later had a very different intent. It was meant to proactively identify unserved and underserved uh, children with disabilities. And it was to provide appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. And it was a child level planning process, not a group level planning process, not for all kids that fit the criteria of coming from uh, low income homes, it was a child by child planning process. And the resources are again, of course, were meant to supplement, not to supplant local effort. So the problem with these two pieces of legislation, well meaning as they are, uh, is that they are in conflict with one another. That uh, the Elementary Secondary Education Act was meant to address poverty and its effects, whereas the Individuals with Disabilities uh, uh, Education Act, which was grandchild of uh, EHA, uh, was, meant to, was meant to prevent and um, uh, prepare children who had disabilities for further education. It was a, a school level planning for ESEA. It was to build capacity of general education to effectively address individual differences for IDEA. Uh, it was child level for uh, IDEA, and as I said, school level for ESEA, and it was uh, predicated on the idea that there was an adequate effort being made by state local agencies in response to these needs for ESEA, and it was new resources uh, that had not existed previously, uh, even at the uh, LEA level for children with disabilities. So what has happened since 1975 and now, and I'm, I'm going to paint a, a less rosy picture of things for you. Uh, between 75 and 83, the percentage of adults who is classified as LD grew to be 500% of expectations. So this troubled everybody. Uh, in, one, in one breath, people were saying, well, you know, it's because the teachers don't really understand learning disabilities, or the schools don't understand how to implicate, uh, in, uh, to implement uh, identification procedures, um, or they don't have adequate resources for doing identification processes or we don't understand how to identify children. But it, it got everybody upset, and it certainly violated expectations. IDEA uh, reconceptualized special education when it was the reauthorization package in 1990, uh, so that social inclusion was the first uh, consideration. Not, not a goal, but it was the first consideration, and that delivery of special education was the second consideration. Early in California, between uh, 1996 and 2002, as we saw, that there was a huge increase in the prevalence of uh, identified cases of autism. This put enormous burden on the schools. Still is. In 2001, No Child Left Behind, which was bipartisan legislation, 
reconceptualized uh, ESEA and became a national pressure and a conceptual framework for general school improvement. The problem here uh, has been that um, the federal government has behaved in a bipartisan way. I, Republicans and Democrats don't get along on most everything else. But they seem to have somewhat of a bipartisan consensus that ESEA ought to be the federal framework for federal involvement in special education. Now, of course, the two parties differ on what they think should go inside of that framework. But they, there seems to be uh, a consensus that helping close an achievement gap between children that are marginalized or children that are underachieving for whatever reason ought to be the basis for federal policy. The problem is, is, that, is that IDEA does not fit neatly under that framework. So during this period of time, the states began to push back a little bit about the <coughs> testing requirements for special education students. So there's been alternative assessments, modified assessments, assessment accommodations. The focus of school reform turned away from evaluating uh, um, uh, the children in the schools to our, in our latest phase is to evaluate teachers. And uh, you all read of, uh, about value-added modeling and its approach to using test scores as a way of uh, determining teachers' uh, general productivity or effectiveness as teachers. So when, when uh, recently, uh, you all probably remember when the LA Times first did this with LA Unified School Di District data and published uh, the results, published names of teachers. Uh, New York City Public Schools very recently did the same thing. And uh, Bill Gates, whose foundation was underwriting much of this effort to use value-added modeling, uh, tried to get them not to do that. And he wrote a very eloquent uh, editorial in the New York Times where he said that the point of this is not to shame teachers. The point of this is to make the education better. And that it's, it's counterproductive to use these methods to shame the teachers and to embarrass them. So uh, that was at least a voice in the wilderness that was making sense. Uh, going forward, what we can expect is that uh, as I'm speaking right this second, people are looking for value-added modeling ways of evaluating special education teachers. Well, we haven't quite recovered from the uh, fiasco of having uh, teachers who are meant to be pedagogical experts evaluated under highly qualified standards. And now we're going to be very quickly trying to deal with how to do evaluations of teachers who don't have uh, very much control of the delivery of the curriculum at all. So um, you can expect that in the near future you're going to, coming to a district near you, there's going to be some discussion about this. And in anticipation of your authorization, uh, the administration, as you know, has implemented what is really its, uh, a sketch of its plan for the reauthorization of ESCA, and they uh, presented this as a race to the top. A race to the top includes very specific requirements that uh, states include the uh, uh, teachers' teacher's ability to move test scores as a <coughs> criteria for evaluating their effort. So right this second, what's happening is that there's a rapid uh, increase in the hiring of our professionals. Uh, this has happened uh, for most of this last decade. If you look here, you can see that of these 373, 466 full-time special education instructional assistants in 2007, California accounted for uh, about a fifth of those. So the problem with this is that these are the least skilled people in the school. Their heart is definitely in the right place. They mean really well, but um, they're not getting good supervision. They're not being well trained. They, when they work in classrooms, they are reacting to children. They're not proactive in terms of either taking advantage of instructional opportunities to teach new material. They're not promoting friendships and social uh, integration. They're, they're really just keeping the peace. And uh, classroom teachers, very professional teachers, uh, try not to be supervisorial with respect to these people. They say, well, these are special education aides. Special education teachers should supervise the teachers. But the special education teacher is somewhere else. She's not physically there in the classroom. 
So we have a big problem. We're spending a lot of money on this. We could get a lot more effect out of these teachers if they were better trained and better supervised, and they had the ability to uh, deliver uh, spot instruction for children with disabilities in the classroom. Uh, the IEP process has been transformed into a, a kind of base goals and objectives that are expressed in state curriculum standards. The IEP was meant to be uh, individualized educational plan that was tailored against the needs of an individual student. There's nothing wrong with desiring the student to be involved in the general curriculum and have engagement in the general curriculum, but when the IEP becomes only a restatement of the general curriculum, only a restatement of state curriculum standards, we've lost we've lost the initial uh, intent of special education legislation. We've seen. Uh, Exclusive graduation standards for diplomas emerge. Um, that, that was so problematic, it only really uh, touched about half of the states. Uh, and California backed away somewhat from its um, rather draconian standards. But we still we have the, uh, a relative consensus that uh, the diploma should mean the child has certain kinds of academic skills. Um, this puts children with uh, disabilities at a great disadvantage. We've seen restrictions on high stakes test alternatives emerge this uh, past few years. So trying to give accommodations or alternative kinds of assessments uh, under common core standards and what will become common core testing of standards are going to find it increasingly difficult to maintain uh, alternative testing. Uh, this has been widespread uh, state adoption of various versions of RTI. So I have, no, I have no argument with RTI as a method of allocating scarce resources in the school to help kids who are not doing well and to try to prevent uh, failures of one sort or another. But as, uh, as a replacement, uh, and the only model for identifying children with learning disabilities, there is no evidence at all that uh, demonstrates that this is a superior way of identifying children with learning disabilities. Um, the idea of value-added uh, modeling uh, integrated with revised teacher evaluation procedures, including special education teachers, in some cases uh, involved in uh, including guiding legislation at the state level. So here's what might happen unless the people in this room talk to their congressmen and uh, try to become more active. What could happen is that IDEA, uh, in fact, if not in law, uh, will continue to be subordinated to the requirements of ESEA. That is not necessarily going to be to the benefit of special education or the children that we teach. Special education teachers will become de facto sort of certificated tutors for general education if their expertise is not enhanced and uh, illuminated. Uh, if we allow things to drift in the way they're going, they will lose uh, both their moral and professional authority to uh, direct the programs of children with disabilities. Individualized instruction by IEPs will become statements of general curriculum priorities and nothing more. They'll cease to be what IEPs were originally intended to be. Uh, differentiated instruction and universal design, both mentioned by John, uh, can have possibly become insubstantial compliance uh, checkoffs. Yes, we're doing differential instruction. Yes, we're doing universal design. Uh, rather than thoughtful efforts to promote best achievement outcomes for students with disabilities, which is, of course, what John was indicating. RTI and other ESEA remedial education efforts uh, could, could begin to supplant child find efforts. So even though the Department of Education issued a, a relatively pointed uh, memorandum to the schools that you're not supposed to delay referral while you complete RTI processes, they, 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 the language of that memorandum allows for the fact that schools will, in fact, do exactly that thing. So what, what they really said in the memorandum was that, that they, they can't interfere with the referral. If somebody makes a referral, the clock runs. But if nobody makes a referral, if the culture of the school is in consensus that we're going to do this RTI process to conclusion before any referrals are going to be heard, uh, then de facto what will happen is, is that you will have uh, undermined child find. 
you want to deny uh, special education. Now, there are no people with black hats in this. There's no bad people in this. Everybody is doing, is trying to do well. But uh, there are, there are uh, outcomes that are unplanned that are possible if they're uncritical about uh, what look like uh, otherwise benign uh, innovations. Special education funds uh, have already begun to sort of drift over the line uh, to fund uh, what are really general education processes and procedures. Uh, the reason we sequestered money for special education was because local school districts, given their own stresses and priorities, would probably not do it. And so the federal government, even though they haven't paid the 40% that John mentioned, that money is supposed to be for the use of children, programs for children with disabilities. We allow that to, uh, unedited, to sort of cross the line and become supplements of general education funding without, without evidence that is actually preventing disabilities or uh, preventing the, the worsening of disabilities, we will have lost a vital resource. And last of all, uh, there's a chance that we're going to resegregate and outsource special education to charter schools. Uh, there are, there are, many of the children that we teach in special education are the least lovely children in school. And they, uh, they are expensive to boot. And so districts in self-defense uh, have considered ways of resegregating children with disabilities all for, good, all for good purposes, not for any bad purposes. But um, again, this is one of those trends that if left unchecked or at least unexamined, uh, can do great damage to the, uh, the revolutionary nature of uh, IDA in providing civil rights and educational rights for children with disabilities. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, please contact any of my colleagues or myself if we can help you with anything, and I'll be around for the morning.
strong no. <laughs> There's no evidence. Thank you. And the next question is uh, directed to John Riley, and it says, uh, I'll read it directly. As you know, the DSM-5 revisions will be finalized and released next year. Do you think the more restrictive autism criteria will be implemented in the schools, that is to reduce the number of ASD students and corresponding to reduce the amount of funding to those schools? Mm -hmm. Well, Mike, he ended up addressing that in his, his remarks, and I agree wholeheartedly. I think a lot of folks will look at it as, Maybe this is being driven by the schoolhouse in order to reduce identification of um, students with autism. Um, I know some folks that, that work on that. They're extremely smart, talented, and I don't have any reason to believe that. Um, I would yield to research on, on that more so, but uh, it'll, it can it can be concerning, and I think the same way inclusion can be concerning because it's a continuum on a service level, and we always have to scrutinize our districts doing that because you know they don't have an instructional assistant or a certified special ed teacher. Uh, we we need to be cognizant of it, but uh, I, I I yield to the the fine minds that are working on that because I I see no evidence that that's that's what's driving it. You know, those kids are theirs. Uh, was mentioned earlier, you know, even though the terms may change, any educator knows within the first few days of working with students, you know, who's who's going to need differentiated instruction, I believe. So. I just to reiterate what I said earlier that a rose by any other name smells as sweet. So it doesn't matter where we draw the lines. A lot of the line drawing categorization serves. Uh, serves scientific purposes and it serves funding purposes. Uh, the children are still there, whatever you call them. So uh, beyond the economic and political problem about you know, what, what they have become eligible for, uh, changing the definition of autism or any other definition is going to uh, resort the children uh, for funding purposes and for service purposes. But the children and the characteristics that they present are still there. The next question, do you propose to do, what do you propose to do to help a special education student, such as ADHD or autism, that refuses to attend school? IEP team can't help if they can't get the student to school. That's true. <laughs> that's, that's an ongoing issue. And, I, I contend that parents are sending the best team they have from, from home. And this, I think, builds the need and support for, we need services that go beyond the schoolhouse. I think it comes back to that, that whole child approach. And, and hopefully there are some community resources built in, either through health department or other agencies, through counseling, that can maybe you know try to work closer with that home environment to get them to school, but you're right, I mean, we can't get them there, we have very limited time of day to work with them as it is, and when they're not there, obviously they're not getting an education or learning, so it's, it's very challenging, and I think, you know, districts need to uh, focus on that, and I think there's some initiative through the current administration to have these community efforts built around school services, and I, I think that is the right direction. <coughs> The next question is, is the Hughes Bill going to be eliminated? Functional analysis assessment are critical for students who exhibit severe behavior, such as aggressive behavior or uh, aggressiveness towards others. Uh, I guess this is sponsored, this is to the congressman. Would you sponsor a law to prohibit districts from bringing attorneys to IEP meetings? Or maybe this would be a policy question. If parents want to audio record IEP meetings, then the district may also record. If parents don't want the media recorded, then no one records. The same should be true for districts bringing attorneys to IEP meetings. If, and only if, 
parents bring an attorney to an IEP meeting, then districts may also do so. Otherwise, no attorneys. We do indeed need to get away from the notion that specialized, that special needs encroach on the other children. All children are funder, funded under the general fund. Special education funds are additional monies. Not enough money, but discrimination and blaming disabled children must stop. There's a lot in there. <laughs> uh, I, I had the issue of uh, going through a due process hearing and, you know, being a teacher, I never realized I should have gone to law school as well because uh, <laughs> the litigation rate is, is incredible. And um, it is very intimidating when parents come with a recorder and want to record. And, and I think the person that wrote this, uh, it sounds like what happens here is happened in Maryland too. And, and that was if one party does want to record them both, what we would do as a school district is we will make the recording give, you know, the parent, usually they're there with a parent advocate or an attorney that has requested the recording. Uh, but yeah, both parties can do the same. And the same is true as if one side would come with an attorney, you simply would ask for a rescheduling of the meeting so that you know the parent or the school district would have representation as well. It's unfortunate that it gets to that level. Um, parent advocates, I, initially, this was a very good thing because this was a marginalized community with of these students for so many years, and I can see how that has grown, but now it has become almost a, an us and them, and, and that's unfortunate because the student doesn't win in that situation. And I've had due process hearings that went on for four or five years, you know, one even going to the Supreme Court, that, uh, you know, and that, that student, the parents moved the child, it was an issue of her hearing and Down syndrome, and they wanted them in a deaf school, you know, school for deaf children, whereas we were providing the resources within the school system and had a satellite program of the Maryland School for the Deaf and the local elementary school for these students. But the litigation went on. It was, it was very divisive and ugly, and it, it's unfortunate for, for all sides when that happens. So, yeah, we've been informed that because of the restraints on time, we're going to have to um, discontinue the other questions. But what I would like to offer on behalf of the congressman is that uh, the congressman's office can receive those questions, forward them to the experts, and then try to get uh, of some response. And so um, the congressman staff will be standing around if there are additional questions. And in, in addition to that, at least he, the congressman will have those for his records. And as he uh, continues to work on behalf of uh, districts and students, then he'll have within his you know, understanding some of the questions that are out there. And he may be able to pose them at committee level. We want to thank John Riley and Michael Gerber for their expertise on the National um, Before we move on, I'd like to uh, welcome Linda Miranda, Special Assistant to the Superintendent for San Bernardino County Schools. We'd also like to Welcome Leticia Garcia, board member in Montana Unified School District. Yeah. Victoria Baca, former school board member from Moreno Valley. Yeah. And Deborah Martin, a candidate for city council in the city of Pomona. Welcome to all of you. <laughs> Moving on to our state panel presentations. Our first state panel presenter is Dr. Robert Morgan. With over 30 years of work in the field of special education, Dr. Robert Morgan provides insights from his experience in the classroom, school district administration, university and state government. He's published numerous articles and presented at national conferences in the area of special education. His current work involves compliance monitoring of public agencies to ensure compliance with federal and state special education laws and regulations. Dr. Robert Morgan. Good morning. Um, thank you, Congressman Baca, for inviting the uh, state representative to come and talk about what we do in the Department of Education and also uh, the things that we talk about. 
at the State Department that are opportunities or challenges for us. And how do you move this along? Oh, I just tell stories. Okay. One of the things, one of the functions that we that we do do is uh, compliance monitoring or OR monitoring the compliance with state and federal law. We have about 160 staff at the Department of Education whose sole responsibilities are to monitor special education law. And it's interesting because um, we're in a bit of a quandary right now, if you can move along, that, um, that um, we are mandated by the Office of Special Education Programs, United States Department of Education, to solely look at compliance. In other words, if a parent asks for a uh, 15, uh, for an assessment plan to uh, whether they might have some concerns about their child in special education, uh, school districts mandated to produce an assessment plan within 15 days. If not, a parent can file a complaint, or we might pick up that in, in our uh, being in districts, or the districts might self-identify that as an area of compliance, and then we prescribe corrective actions. That's the role that we've been placed in by the Office of Special Education Programs. Okay. Now that's actually counter to the IDEA. The IDEA actually challenges us to improve the outcomes for students with disabilities. And that's what we're supposed to be in the business of monitoring. And yet the Office of Special Education, the United States Department of Education, has given us the role to ensure simple compliance. Okay. In fact, what's going on right now in San Bernardino, Riverside, and San, San Diego counties is all the school districts and the county offices are completing self-review, special education self-reviews. They're, they're busy. Um, I was surprised to hear that they're expending resources, as I know that the, there are budget concerns in the district, but they're actually going to spend some money and time trying to remedy those non-compliances and identify those non-compliances during the summer, uh, which that's a concern because that's money going out of the classroom, but that's something that they're mandated to do. And that it, you know, we're not the ones necessarily mandating that. That's the Office of Special Education Programs. Um, and to tell you how this has grown exponentially, um, this is from our annual performance report that we provide to the uh, Office of Special Education Programs. In 2007, we identified 33,000 instances of non-compliance with special education law, and all of those were corrected. Moving on to 2008, we have 38,000 instances of non-compliance that were identified, and then we um, have corrective actions, and all those corrective actions have been closed. Then we moved to uh, 2009, which is the most recent reporting period and we have 48,000 uh, instances of non-compliance and unfortunately a lot of that is getting into the tiny minutia of special education and what it's about and now what OSEP has actually done this year in the same way that they mo we monitor school districts compliance with federal and state special education law OSEP monitors us, the State Department, to ensure that we're monitoring school districts. Now, they've actually suspended their monitoring of school districts, this, uh, not school districts, but of State Departments this year, because they reflected back and said, well, we're missing the, um, the impetus of the IDEA is to improve the outcomes for students with special education needs. And they're taking this year off to mo of monitoring, not the data monitoring, but off to sit back and say, how can we evaluate or how can we improve